I'm going to, there's the recording. Um, I'm just going to be talking a bit about um, the work I'm doing here at UQ um, and the speculative fiction autobiography that I am attempting to write. And I'm just sort of, it's a little bit about what I'm doing, about other writers that have done similar things and stuff I'm hoping that will be useful for, for us, like for writers to think about and talk about because I'm in sort of the process of it at the moment. And I do have a PowerPoint, so I will now attempt to share screen and that usually works. So let's give it a shot. It would be helpful if I was in the right place. There we go. I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to minimize you guys. Okay. Okay, I hope that's working. If it's not, somebody shout because I can no longer see you or me because I hate, I hate seeing me on these Zoom screens. So yeah, anyway, so hi. Um, I am all my, because we were just talking about social media in the previous panel, all my social media things are there and um, this screen is gonna be up for just a few minutes. So if you wanna follow me on any of the things, please do. I love to talk about writing and Japan and cats and all of that stuff. So um, please do. Um, I'm just going to start with a little bit of a um, quote from one of the stories from this speculative fiction autobiography, and then I'll get into my main sort of presentation and then we can talk and any questions, any discussions, any feedback, any thoughts, anything at the end, that would be awesome. So here we go. Um, okay. The night is quiet and Saturday dawns cloudy. It stays that way. Without the sun, a winter chill settles into everything. My apartment, my clothes, the streets themselves. I trip over the cat as soon as I step outside. She's scrawnier than she seemed in the dark. There are scabs on her nose and old tears run dry trails from her eyes. Her coat is dirty, not as white as I thought, just a common feral cat, yet still she carries her candle. Flame and all. Ano, wadabi mochi, loko desu ka? Where is wadabi mochi? I hope. What a ridiculous thing to say, even to a cat, especially to a cat. But I don't know how else to do it. And she stands and turns and guides me like it made sense, like she understood. Through the town and all day we walk down narrow alleys with elaborate streetlights, all stained glass and wrought iron, past towering apartment blocks and old houses with Zen gardens. We pass ramen shops and dominoes, cozy izakayas and vending machines, an elaborate hilltop temple and a tiny rundown shrine wedged between houses. Multiple 7-Elevens, family marts and Lawson's, cafes, bakeries and soda noodle restaurants. As the day stretches into evening, it grows so cold, my hands are frozen stiff inside their gloves. I've lost all sense of direction, no idea where my apartment, where home is anymore. And then a small white truck turns a corner and rolls into the street towards me. Rust stained with flat tires, it looks a little like a ute and nothing like an ice cream van. There's a rickety box of steel and wood set up in the tray, draped with a tarpaulin roof and just tall enough for someone to sit inside. A curtain has been drawn around the frame and a sickly purple light glows within. The van drags a torn fabric sign. What's left of the kanji and hiragana written on it are too scratched out to read. The van stops in front of me. Fingers creep from beneath the curtain metallic, skeletal. Irashaimase, welcome. Uh, Warabi, um, my voice squeaks as I fumble a handful of yen. Warabi mochi um, hitotsu, onegaishimasu? One warabi mochi, please. A nutty soybean scent wafts out of the van as the curtain is pulled back. It carries hints of dark, sugary kurumitsu syrup and something else, something like grease or oil. The man that leans on the counter has fingers of steel, arms too, painted with faded colours. The buttons of his dirty blue shirt are undone, revealing an emaciated chest, but his face is plump, youthful, and he smiles with a mouthful of healthy white teeth. 
He is both exactly and nothing like I imagined. His arms unfold and with many hinges as he takes the coins from my hand. And that didn't work. Hang on. There we go. So this is an excerpt from Warabi Mochi, one of the short stories that combined make up the project I'm currently working on, my speculative fiction autobiography. So autobiography, did I just tell you a true story? When we write about our lived experiences, there's an expectation of honesty, a pact between writer and reader that autobiography will be true. However, there are times when a traditional non-fiction memoir feels incomplete. How do we factor in the unreal aspects of real life, the world that exists in our imagination but is no less true? And so this is what I'm currently researching and writing about in my creative writing PhD here at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. And sorry, I picked a really bad room to sit in, but it was it had decent internet. You can't see the beautiful outdoors. Um, and I will just take a moment to sigh wistfully and let you know that I wish I was there and I wish we were all together in Japan meeting in Kanagawa and hopefully maybe next year. Very briefly about me. Um, so yeah, my name is Joanne Anderson and I'm an author who likes to mix her genres. I almost feel like that should be an AA. My name is Joanne and I like to mix my genres. Most of what I write is speculative fiction, science fiction, fantasy, horror, weird, combination of any of those. Um, these so far include the novels Debris, Suited and Guardian. Um, the short story collection, The Bone Chime Song and Other Stories, and the, the brand new collection, which is this one, um, which is actually officially released in like three days. Um, and this is Inanimate Tales of Everyday Fear. Um, recently, though, I have started to branch out. My children's picture book, which is also up there, um, The Flying Optometrist, is about rural healthcare and how lucky we are to wear glasses and have such easy access to these vital blindness defying tools. I've also published creative nonfiction in Island Magazine, The Anjan, um, The Japan News as well. I worked in publishing and book selling and marketing and distribution for a very long time before giving it up to live in Japan from 2019 to 20 and no, um, prizes for guessing why I may have had to finish that earlier than I expected. And now I'm doing this PhD. So you can see uh, mixing genres is nothing new to me. But with this speculative fiction autobiography, I'm trying to do something really specific and different from the kind of uh, genre bending that I usually embark on. I'm attempting to use speculative fiction to tell the true story of the time that I spent living in Japan. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about that process, why I'm doing it, how it's working, what other authors have done that are similar, and I hope what writers can gain from this research and experimentation, and hopefully we can share in that. Um, so, how do you recount a lived experience? when writing it as a traditional memoir feels incomplete? Is it possible to mingle science fiction, fantasy and horror with autobiography, but maintain a sense of truth? So my speculative fiction autobiography examines how the fantastic elements of specfic can be used to explore the deep truths of lived experience. It's currently titled The Realness of Unreal Things, and um, it is a mixed genre collection. It's blending speculative fiction short stories and creative non-fiction essays drawn from the time I spent living in Saitama. I was in Japan to teach English. And yes, I was on the JET program, um, inspired by my love of the country, my desire to get to know it better, and the complete loss of direction that I had in my real life. Um, I had just been through some rather significant life-changing events, and I honestly wasn't sure that I recognized myself, let alone knew what I wanted to do with my life. 
So while I was living in Japan, I filled notebooks with my experiences and my observations. And as all the authors in this room, room will understand, I scribbled these notes fully expecting to write about them. However, when I came to do that, I couldn't settle on a genre. Traditional memoir or nonfiction of some kind, it just felt incomplete. But speculative fiction inspired by my articles, my journals, lacked the honesty that I really felt driven to convey. So would it be possible to do both, to mingle spec fic but maintain a sense of truth? I could not, for example, write about that Marabi Mochi van that wandered the streets at night in my little town without capturing the way its surreal song bled a kind of physical otherness into my world. And at the same time, how could I truthfully talk about my experience without analyzing the impact that reading Kafka on the shore for the first time had on my sense of place and the fact that like it summoned like this stray cat that just came and followed me and accompanied me on my journey ever since. So my life in Japan was both real and unreal. It was physical and imagined. And the realness of unreal things is my way of trying to explore these conflicting, equally true experiences. So the fiction in the collection tends towards horror and the weird, but I'm also hoping to incorporate some science fiction and fantasy. Um, the creative nonfiction includes personal essays, ficto criticism, memoir. The whole like theoretical point is to try and interrogate the strengths and the limitations of both genres, weave them together, blur the lines between what's real and unreal so that any attempt to define it as speculative or factual would be just sort of resisted. Let's see how that goes, eh? I'm gonna backtrack just a tiny bit to that pat that I mentioned earlier, the expectation that a reader, uh, from a reader, that what they read in an autobiography will be true. Um, this is the autobiograph autobiographical pact, um, and it comes from Philip Lejeune in the 1970s. He defined autobiography as, and I'm going to quote, um, retrospective prose narrative written by a real person concerning his own experience, where the focus is his individual life and in particular, the story of his personality. So there are some central things to this definition, the kind of language being narrative prose, the subject being a life or the story of a personality, a retrospective point of view, and an author who is real and identical to the narrator and the principal character. And so more than all of that, this whole classification of autobiography hinges on an assurance from the author to the reader that this is their true story. But this assurance doesn't exist anywhere in the text. It's a construct and it relies on external factors, things that we call paratext. So as simple as the author's name on the cover of a book matching the name of the narrator, the words an autobiography or a memoir as part of the title, where as a reader you find it on the bookshelf or where you see it reviewed, these are paratextual messages that assign credibility to that text before we so much as open the first page. Lejeune's definition is central to this evolving like, understanding of what the autobiography is, but it's also come under a lot of criticism. Um, there are some theorists who argue that it can't, you can't even call autobiography a genre based on this definition because what Lejeune is talking about is an act of reading, not a way of writing something. But more fundamental than that, and more interesting, I think, to me and us, um, are questions of whether or not we can even capture a life in a story. Our lives, our experiences, our understandings of self are so nuanced. Which version of self or life are we even writing about when we write autobiography? Do we know ourselves well enough to be able to write truthfully about that in the first place? 
Um, Lejeune himself even admitted that this was problematic and he actually debated whether or not an author can be considered a person because the idea of author is a textual construct. Anyway, there's another theorist, um, Paul John Eakin, and he said that the most important element of an autobiography is that it has a sincere effort to come to terms with and understand ourselves. But what if that sincerity, what if that requires speculation and breaks away from historical exactitude? Lejeune also said that autobiography is pragmatic and it's open to other genres and that there's always scope to do other things under its umbrella. Another factor that I want to just talk about briefly is the role that like narrative structure and genres play in how we tell our stories and what effect this has on the truth of those stories. So we know that all stories are mediated through a narrative discourse of some kind. Narrative along with language is the distinctive trait that makes us human. Um, so as infants, we start making narratives, like we put subjects and verbs together at about the same time that we start making memories that last. There are some theories that say that our ability to tell a story about ourselves to ourselves is how we position and understand our identity in time and also in relation to other people. Narratives literally create our way of understanding I. And all understanding of self is done in relation to the story that we tell and the story of others. So selfhood and language, they happen at the same time, they are dependent on each other and they create each other. Which is cool, great, but while we therefore rely on narratives to tell our story, those narratives frame and shape our stories and we can't escape the fact that life like day-to-day -day events do not come with a narrative structure inbuilt. So anytime we tell a true story, even if we're telling someone this is a true story, we're altering those events to fit a narrative frame without meaning to do it, without even being aware that we're doing it. Genre is another consideration that I'm particularly interested in being a genre writer and also working in marketing for so long and being so keenly aware of that question from booksellers, where does it fit on the shelf? Um, genre labels that we give our stories, like they have a lot to do with that marketing, with the bookstore, and they bring baggage with them, expectations around content and form that we really can't ignore. So um, a genre is a recurrent literary form, but it's often bound up with master plots, these stories that we repeatedly tell ourselves in myriad forms. We as readers connect our thinking to master plots without being aware of it and give credibility to narratives that are structured by them. Spec fic, speculative fiction, sorry, I always, keep, always call it spec fic, in particular, uh, carries with it very specific baggage of master plots, structures, and expectations, as does creative nonfiction and autobiography. But the way we tell a narrative within these genres really needs to accommodate these reader expectations. So when I talk about speculative fiction, I use it as an umbrella term. I'm capturing it um, literature that speculates in a fictional way on things that are not true. Um, oh, hang on, I think I need to... No, I don't, sorry. Anyway, um, so... Speculative fiction is literature that speculates in a fictional way on things that are not true. That's a really helpful definition from Kim Wilkins, who's an amazing writer and also my supervisor. Um, it can be broken down into three subgenres: fantasy, science fiction, and horror, although there are many other permeations and hybrids of these. What is essential in all spec fic is the creation of that sense of infinite possibility um, and most speculative fiction published for an English language market is structured around three acts, your beginning, your middle, your end, um, and has a focus. And this is, I think, the most important thing. Like it, it's a focus on world building of some kind, fantastical world building or far future, or even um, near future world building. And now it's time for the next slide. Um, Sophia Sonata, um, another amazing speculative fiction writer, 
explains the urge to incorporate speculative elements into memoir writing as reaching towards the intensely imagined to tell the truth. Fiction already creates a space that invites the reader to interpret, to transpose themselves into the life of others. Speculative fiction takes the imagination that step further and it builds whole worlds. Uh, so I'm thinking creative nonfiction. So we know creative nonfiction, the lyric essay or lyrical nonfiction uses techniques that we commonly employ to write fiction, such as scenes, uh, plot, suspense, to write nonfiction. Um, creative nonfiction can evoke an emotional response from the reader, but it still engages in thoughtful, rigorous analysis of its subject. A nonfiction narrative, therefore, is a process of applying structure to true events as they become something less like one thing after the other after the other and more of a cohesive story. Creative nonfiction can be quite lyrical, even experimental in the ways it achieves this storification. But a balance really has to be struck between art and fact, or your, your reader kind of starts to suspect that maybe this is not the truth. But this whole destabilizing the expectation of truth around memoir, it, in my mind, invest, enables an investigation into how memory shapes our idea of self, it intersects the imagined and becomes something monstrous but authentic. And I think that this relates way back to Lejeune's definition of autobiography as the story of a personality because so much of what shapes us is this imagined and yet real to us space. And surely there can be no truth of a lived experience without the parts of our everyday lives that aren't corporeal. Anyway, so while there are limits to this truth that we can represent in autobiography, that doesn't discredit the attempt to write it. And it doesn't stop readers from wanting to read true stories, even if some part of us as readers and writers knows that no story can ever be totally true. So I'm interested in what other solutions we can find um, to tell our stories without being hamstrung by this idea of truth. So these are the books that I wanna recommend as books that do similar things to what I'm trying to do. Um, and I've got uh, a list of um, links to find them, which I'll, can, I'll pop in the chat after this PowerPoint has gone and I can see what's going on. Um, so I'm gonna talk very briefly about them because um, any attempt to write autobiographical narrative has to tackle this gray area between truth and fiction. Very few that I have been able to find um, trying to do this speculative fiction autobiography that I'm playing with. Very few expressly use speculative fiction to tell an autobiographical story because I mean, spec fic is made up, right? Um, speculative memoir and other adjacent genres are engaged in similar acts of destabilizing this relationship between real and unreal. Um, and these are four texts that I think do that. So Monster Portraits by Del and, Dufia, uh, Del and Sophia Sanatia. Uh, the Last Days of Kali Yuga by Paul Haynes. Carmen Maria Mercado's stunning memoir in the dream house. Anything by Carmen Maria Mercado is amazing, read it and Kate Sembreno's really heartbreaking book of mutter. Um, I'm gonna very briefly talk about them. So in Monster Portraits, Del and Sophia Samata have written what they call an uncanny imaginary autobiography of otherness. It is on the surface an imagined fieldwork journal in which the unnamed protagonists record their encounters with monsters through illustration, through research, narration, even end notes and references. What might not be immediately apparent though, is that these unreal monsters in this book simultaneously tell the true, the real story of Del and Sophia growing up biracial in America in the 1980s, I believe. Um, so Monster Portraits is not a day-by-day -day account of a childhood. What it is, however, is an honest account of a feeling, an emotional truth that required monstrousness to be expressed in a way that did it justice. 
Paul Haynes did something similar in his collection, The Last Days of Kali Yuga. Paul was a multiple award-winning Australian horror writer who published more than 30 short stories and three collections until his death from cancer in 2012. He was 41 when he died, which is terrifying because that's now my age. Um, his horror is dark and uncomfortable and he often turned the lens on himself. He explored topics, things that are now known as toxic masculinity with this brutal honesty. While not all the stories are autobiographical, many teeter on the lines between memory and speculation. Um, they have been described as indecipherable between truth and falsehood, fiction and reality. He had a series of stories that were called backpacker horror stories. Um, the Last Days of Kali Yuga is one of them. The Festival of Colour was another. These were inspired by his travels as a young man, but often included a protagonist named Paul Haynes. And immediately this creates a suspicion with you as the reader and also a deepening sense of dread, how much of this actually happened because they're horror stories. But his most autobiographical, I think, is a story called The Past is a Bridge Best Left Burnt. And it's not a backpacker story. It's a domestic slice of life horror. It charts the day-by-day -day terrors of awful jobs, of niggling poor health, and a recurring nightmare about jumping off a bridge in the peak hour. It's got this really interesting patchwork structure. It has no real narrative arc. It mingles imagination and introspection with real life, but it is utterly engaging and really heartbreaking. And it's the kind of horror in which an author bears the darkness of their souls. And how much more real and honest can you get than that? Even if none of the events he, account, he recounted ever actually happened. Um, Carmen Maria Mercado adds considerable speculation in this memoir in the dream house. While it's not speculative fiction as such, the effect of othering, of creating a gap between the events that happened the truth of those the event the, and the truth of those events through the story I used to tell you about them works in a similar fashion to what Dell and Sophia Samata, Paul Haynes and I do through speculative fiction. It is an impossible story that is nonetheless true. And she uses genre tropes to engage with and unpack a narrative of abuse in a sex, single sex relationship. Structurally, it's a really fascinating book. She braids memoir and essay and invokes genre labels, tropes and expectations. Each chapter, for example, is headed the dream house as something. So the dream house as a metaphor, an inciting incident, a romance novel. She's keenly aware of the storiness of this memoir and is not trying to hide from us from the fact that it is constructed. And she actually revels in that, she leverages it. In the dream house explores the narrative structures we use to tell stories and uses the gap between those structures to tell hers. But why? Because her story of abuse feels unreal, even to herself. And this leaves her searching for a way to express the inexpressible, the deeper truth. And finally, I'm just gonna to touch on Kate Zambrano's Book of Mutter. Um, this memoir employs a similar braiding of memory, art, memoir and more, in which she rearranges the chronology and she gathers evidence to find a way to tell the story of her mother's cognitive decline and eventual death. Unlike a traditional memoir, Kate doesn't tell us about her childhood and her relationship with her mother in a chronological way. She, instead, she messes around with the timeline. She mingles the works of others, even her own theoretical reflections on the nature of art and the meaning of it. It's the gaps that she's interested in, the finding a way to write an absence. And I would argue that that's what horror and the weird does. What are ghosts, if not absences, that are still present? All this to capture the true sense of her experience and the untruth of her own memory of that experience. 
So these texts demonstrate that writing speculation of some kind into autobiographical acknowledges the parts of the everyday that are not situated in the real world, such as daydreaming, fantasies, the inaccuracy of our memory. And I think that this allows to act, us to access a more internal emotional reality. It's the kind of truth that we find in fiction, the truth of meaning rather than the truth of fact. So that's great, right? By this point, it's all sounding very theoretical and I'm sorry about that, but um, I for one love discussing the concept of what is I? Is I a dialogue between all my various selves and my relationships, past, present, future? I could do that for hours, preferably with beer. But um, I also want to get into the, some of the specifics of writing practice as well. How do you write autobiography as speculative fiction and remain honest to the truth of that experience? One of the key questions I had to answer as I started this actual writing process was what does this truth even mean? I keep saying I want to speak to the truth of my lived experience, but in a practical sense, what does that look like? So I started by digging through the notes that I had taken, reading back over the events that I had chosen to record and work out why. Of all the stuff that happens to us in our day-to-day -day lives, why were those the moments I decided to write down? And as I did, I noticed some common themes. Identity is super big one. Moments or events that made me look at myself differently. Isolation, definitely yes. My experience in Japan was rich and it was full of new friends and coworkers. Um, and I found myself able to connect with students, with expats, with locals in my town, but that didn't change the disconnect that I felt with the language and the culture and the distance between my old life and the people I cared about in Australia, only made more vivid when the pandemic set in. Connected to both of these was the struggle to find a place where I belonged. And I think hanging over everything, the concept of finding, of making a home. I see now with hindsight that um, given I had just lost the home, I always I thought I would always have. Before I even came to Japan, this was a preoccupation that colored a lot of my experience. So these then were my core troops. This is a wobbly term that I'm still playing with, but this is what I'm still gonna use for now. The core truth, the deeper psychological truths of the experience, more important to me than the actual day-to-day actual -day happenings. So I isolated these key moments that spoke to these truths and then how to decide what to write as speculative fiction, what to write as creative nonfiction, and how to do either of those things, but still be honest. I think the best way to delve into this creative process, which is a difficult thing to do at the best of times, is through example. Um, and so I will just talk about Watabi Mochi a little bit, that story I read at the beginning. So Watabi Mochi is a story about the van that stalked the streets at night in the town where I was living selling mochi and sweet potato. I'd already read about these vans. I wasn't super surprised by its existence, but what I hadn't expected was the tinny robotic song that he just sung into the darkness. I'm gonna make an idiot of myself. There's nobody else here and I can't see you guys. So I don't know if you're laughing at me, but the song went, <clears throat> what a be mochi, <laughs> oishi mochi. Anyway, so it did that late at night at all times. And then it kept vanishing on me. Like I chased this ghostly song through the streets and it was like already November, so it was cold. For weeks, maybe months, I'd be half asleep and I'd hear it through the wall of the apartment. I'd be writing home from Japanese practice. It would filter down the side streets. And no matter how hard I tried to find it, it just didn't seem to be real. And so right there, there's my core truth. In the unreality of that real van, I saw a lot about the unreality of the real people in my new life. Relationships that I was reaching for but could never quite grasp. One relationship in particular. So what to do with that? I could tell a true story in which I struck up a friendship, thought it might turn into a romantic relationship, learned the hard way that it would not. 
and I have. But in order to properly convey that uncanny, that liminal space of not understanding how another person is feeling, I also am writing about the impossible Wadabi Mochi band. So, hmm, love and Mochi, they're both wobbly and difficult to grasp, right? <laughs> so the quest for love became the search for Mochi, both equally surreal and ultimately disappointing. Unfamiliar streets made even more unreal in that space by both the song and the longing, they become literally unreal in this story. And yet every turn, every detail, like the bakery that never seemed to be open when you'd expect it, and the stray local cat who guided me are the honest truth, at least my honest truth, and what other truth is there? Resisting the urge to turn this story into something else, into a quest narrative that fulfills a more traditional Western storytelling structure wasn't easy but I knew that I had to keep to the truth of what happened. Many times I forced myself to stop the writing, look at it, change direction, pull back to that core truth, that van, that romance, both as real and unreal as each other. Oh, and I really actually, like I did find that van by the end, by the way, the man who ran it was absolutely nothing like I expected and the mochi was really gross. So, what is the point of all this talking? What am I trying to convey? I'm hoping to share with you the process of what I'm doing, the joys and the challenges of writing speculative fiction into my autobiography. Wouldn't it be easier, some might and have already said, just to write a memoir? You, don't, you want to write about your time in Japan? Great, so do that. And don't bother with all the science fiction-y stuff but I can't. <laughs> and this is the joy bit, like partially because I'm a spec fic author first, foremost, and forever. And I love my genres of choice. The reason for that is the same reason I think that they work when you add them to memoir. Because in the fantastical, there is honesty. In the unreal, there is truth. A ghost to me is a way I can confront loss and ache and hurt. A quest helps us understand our place in an unordered world. A prophecy reassures us. An apocalypse helps us appreciate the world we have. But this joy is the same as the challenge. While I believe in the truth of my ghosts, my spaceships, my apocalypses, apocalypse, apocalypses, can I convince others? How to break down the immediate assumed reaction that this can't be true? How do I keep myself honest when toying with the freedom of imagination? Writing speculative fiction autobiography forces me into a rigorous assessment of honesty in everything I write, not just this. It makes me look at the way I organize all my stories, the weight of the language I use, and ultimately the emotional response I hope to create in the reader. And I think that has benefits across all the writing and across for all of us. By introducing speculative fiction into the autobiographical mix, the realness of unreal things brings this unstable relationship between truth and fiction, self and other, to the forefront, assisting readers and writers to confront our expectations and our assumptions about genre, and the judgments we assign a story based on where it was placed in the shelf. By writing the speculative fiction into the book autobiographical, I'm tackling some personal demons too. As a writer of speculative fiction and a person who imagines and daydreams routinely, I realized that I'm, I'm working to create a space where I give myself permission to be honest about how much of my life exists in its intangible parts, exists in here. This is something I hope will resonate with um, other researchers, other creatives with myself and um, like myself, sorry, and hopefully everyone here. And so that's, that's me. Thank you. And I'm going to escape that.
and I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to come back. <laughs> Thank you. I saw that, um, I, yeah. Oh, thank you for the link. Any more links, please? Yes. Please send them. And if anyone has any questions or any comments or anything at all, I'd love to hear them. But I'm very quickly going to put some links to those amazing books in the chat because I saved them here. So I would remember to do that. Now I'm going to drink tea. Um, do I think that this kind of memoir might be difficult to market? Uh, yes, yes, I do. <laughs> um, so, so much of my writing uh, being published experience has been, this is difficult to market which is really ironic given that I worked for marketing, worked in marketing for 15 years. Um, even, even the spec fic I write is like, it's not, not hundred percent science fiction. It's not hundred percent fantasy. What is it? Nobody knows that was hard enough. So yeah, luckily I'm doing this as a PhD. So at the moment, um, they're paying me to do it, which is great. <laughs> um, I think ultimately if, if I can, um, I'll end up with a bunch of short stories and a bunch of essays. And if I have to separate them out and sell them individually, I will do that. Um, it would be great to be able to sell them together because I want them to talk to each other and reflect back on each other and do all this kind of stuff. Um, but we will see. <laughs> I'm only at the very beginning. I've only been doing this since April. So um, it's not, uh, not going to be my first concern right now. <laughs> Thank you. Can I uh, can I ask a question? Um, Please. Uh, thank you. Thank you for a terrific presentation, Joanne. Uh, it seems to me that the space that you are opening up for us in your uh, joining of speculative fiction with autobiography is a very familiar space to poets and poetry. Yes. Because that you used the word the uh, what was it? you used that liminal the uh, uncanny liminal space which is just such a familiar backyard for those of us that write and read poetry I, I I can't wait to read some of the books you recommend and what you've written but it is very much one of the things that poetry doesn't have to worry about the genres if you know what I mean because you can do whatever you want you can turn somersaults in a wheelbarrow you know going to the moon kind of thing you know mm. yeah yeah definitely and I have to I mean I I'm not a poet. I don't write poetry. Um, I have mad respect for anyone who does. <laughs> Thank I was you. Thinking, <laughs> I was just thinking of Dorothy Porter, you know, who is uh, who is an Australian poet who wrote poetic novels. She mm -hmm. died of cancer at 40, 40, mm -hmm. mid 40s, terrible. But her very punchy, very powerful, very emotional, very 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 uh, sculptured poems dragged the reader through autobiofiction as well as um, a detective fiction genre or a speculative fiction um, flirtation with uh, mm -hmm. with astrophysics and things like that. Sorry, oh, I'll that's show. fantastic. Thank you. I'll, any, yeah, any recommendations are so so interesting because I'm really enjoying reading what other people were doing within similar sort of space and. Um, you know, especially at this early stage, it's just, it's research, it's inspiring, it's great. So thank you. David, can you tell us again who that author was? So we can uh, yes, her name is Dorothy Porter, P-O-R-T-E-R. Um, her, mo her, her most celebrated book, two most celebrated books are Monkey Grip and the book uh, Akhenaten, who, of course, was uh, married to Nefertiti. Um, mm. That was a text I remember teaching many for many years when I taught contemporary contemporary Australian writing. And just as Joanne has so terrifically reminded us, 
although that was about history, the kind of factuality that Joanne was referring to, it, it very much includes um, the emotional and, and physical and sexual experiences of a woman's life in looking at this ancient Egyptian. Uh, uh, Joanne, you might actually like to look at a couple of those too. I mean, just as tangents to what you're doing, because they just, they knock you for six, you know, and they're really, really fantastically powerful pieces of writing. Mm, yeah, I will. Thank you. I thought it was really interesting how you said um, that this sort of the the speculative part of it makes room. How do I say that? Like you said it so well, and I can't necessarily paraphrase it, but you know, you said like the the speculative or the fictional part of it sort of made room for memories and reality, and I just that's so fascinating because I think. I guess this is more of a comment than a question, but it's really interesting how those two things that are very opposite sort of reveal each other in a way. Yeah, yeah. And it's just the whole process of, of doing this, you know, you, especially I think when you're, you're, you've got to um, argue for it to university that, you know, please, please pay me money to do this. Um, and so you come up with all these weird sort of arguments and then you sit back and go, okay, why do I actually want to do this? What am I doing? You know, <laughs> and, um, and as, as, as I've been working and writing and reading and I sort of realized that I think it's, it's like this, this part of me as a speculative fiction writer and fan, like I'm a consumer of, of spec fic as well. Um, you know, it, it's like I'm arguing for this thing that I've always argued for. You know, it's like a, I've always had these discussions with people where they, um, we know they don't, oh, I know I don't read that because it's not real. And I'm like, but, but, but this thing that you do read is not real either. Do you not see? You know, I think I'm, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm talking back to that old argument and I'm trying to find a place for uh, existing in between those two things. Oh, yeah. Um, you don't realise, I think, and I guess that's the same for writing any book or any short story or any poem or anything. You don't necessarily realise why you're doing it until you've maybe done it or you're in the middle of doing it or yeah, or even if ever, until somebody somebody else tells you, oh, I, I, I read it and I, you were talking about, I saw that you were writing about this and you just thought, no, I, I have never written about that. And then you realize that, yeah, you, you did. You just didn't know you did it. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, so what has been the reaction? Like when you share this, for example, I know you've just started your program, mm. but like what has been the reaction of people as they've read it? Like what do your readers think? Um, yeah, so so far, like it's, it's been very good. I mean, it's, it's early days, right? Um, but there's, I have had quite a few like, oh, well, what bit was real? You know, was this, was this real or was this real? And um, the mochi vans is, is a really interesting one um, because I have actual, like when I was looking, I was trying to follow this van in the, in the streets at night and I've got video of, of the song and nobody believed me until I would show them the video and then they like, oh, you're right, that is really creepy. I'm like, yes, it is really creepy. Um, yeah, so I think that's going to be, and it's, an, it's a difficult thing to try and do in the first place. Um, blur the lines you know it's great it's really easy to say but how do I make it so that it's not really obvious and now we're stepping into science fiction and now we're stepping into non-fiction trying to do that in a natural way um, without getting that reaction from people where they say oh is this the part that you made up and this is the part that's real um, but yeah yeah so so far I mean I haven't shared it with a whole lot yet because they're all very early draft um, and I'm my process at the moment is to, to write it all to get it all down so all the all the stories all the essays and then put them all next to each other and see what what they're doing and revise them edit them into a cohesive something yeah <laughs> but thank you guys thank you for letting me just talk about this because it's it's something that you, you know, I'm, I'm, it's taking up so much of my brain space, obviously. Um, and it's really interesting just to be able to 
to voice it and to see what people think of it. And um, yeah, so I, I appreciate the, the space. Um, and I had wanted to come to the, the writers conference last year and yeah, everything just fell apart. <laughs> I feel more stable now. <laughs> Hey, hey, Joanne, there are particular Japanese writers who, who, who have a, a foot in both the spec fic and the realist fic fiction um, camps. I'm thinking of Sayaka Murata's recent mm. novel, Earthlings, but Haruki Murakami, uh, mm. you know, uh, it just <laughs> the cat's there on the street kind of thing. The other world is just uh, unashamedly in, in that doorway. Yeah. And I think, because um, like I, was, I mentioned Capra on the shore, like the, I had only been in um, my, I lived in a um, smallish town in Saitama and I'd only been there um, a week or so. And I met uh, someone who was like helping me practice my Japanese and she gave me an old battered copy of Capra on the shore and said, oh, if you've never read it, you need to read it. And of course I was like, oh yes, I've always wanted to read this. And then as I started reading it, this cat turned up and this cat's following me around everywhere and it's talking to me, but not in cat language, not in, and I'm just like, it, immediately that blurring sort of started happening. And I, it was a little bit of a springboard into the whole thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, actually that, so Joanne, I have to say, I enjoyed this immensely. This was Thank really you. wonderful. And Thank you so I, much. I wish, actually, I would love, to talk about this a lot longer, but we have another presentation. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but no, this was fantastic. And I wanted to, I'm gonna stop the recording.